if you go real quickly, you don't have to turn there either, but Revelation, I think it's chapter 21 I read from last night. It says, um, hang on, oh, give me one second here. I'm sorry, my Bible is completely falling apart here, so... Um, uh, do, 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 oh, yeah. Uh, got it right here in front of me. It says, and the, this Revelation 22, and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. All right, so there you go. That's, that's just a real, uh, uh, we spent, what, an hour, hour and 15 minutes talking about this particular festival last night, but those are a couple key verses, but it all goes back to booths or tabernacles and how they point to Jesus Christ. Anyway, not the same location, but just wanted to bring that up because it mentions Sukkot. Okay, verse 21, please. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. Then he did not take away the pillar or cloud of cloud by day or the pillar of night, from before the people. Okay, so you have the pillar of cloud, it leads the way, and you're going to see that when later, when the cloud moves, the people pack up their camp and they move. And then when the cloud stops, that's where they camp. And this went on for 38 years of wandering in the wilderness after receiving the law of Mount Sinai. But at this point, the pillar is showing them where to go. He is leading them. And remember, do you remember last week what we talked about? They went through the wilderness of Sinai instead of directly into Egypt. Why was that? We talked about that last week. Why did he not take them directly from Egypt up to Israel? Well, but he... War. He said that if they see war, they will be fearful and they'll want to return back to Egypt. Let me see if I can find that real quickly. Very good. Um, anyway, he led them specifically into the wilderness rather than taking the shorter distance. If you, and I don't know, maybe I didn't show you because we had all that writing all over the thing last week, but, and maybe I did. If I showed you this already, I apologize, but here's Israel. Here's the Red Sea down here. Here's the wilderness of Sinai. Here's Egypt over here. And I know I'm blowing this a little bit. But uh, anyway, this is where the Nile goes out into the Mediterranean. And it's very short walk to go from here up to Israel. But instead, he led them through the Red Sea and uh, actually through this big wilderness area. The Red Sea, we'll make it over here, this big wilderness area. And then they got to the Red Sea, crossed that, and then they were in here because they disobeyed God for 38.8 years. Anyway, and then eventually they went up. But to go from here, one of these areas, there's a place somewhere right around here called Kadesh Barnea. To go from here to here is 11 days. And we're going to see that at the very beginning of Deuteronomy. It's like an indictment on their bad behavior because it says from Kadesh Barnea to this other place, it's 11-day journey. And instead, they spent 38 years wandering in the wilderness until the whole generation had died. But anyway, the Lord, instead of taking them the quick way, took them the long way. And the reason why he did that is because he didn't want them to have to face war. They didn't have any swords. They didn't have any fighting implements. And they would have been fearful. And so... That's why he did that. But anyway, he is leading them. They are following. And you've got a cloud that is moving in front of you. And then at night, you've got a pillar of fire. You would think, you would think that the people would pay attention. Yeah, oh, yeah, God is leading us. But you're going to see very quickly here the result of the people lacking faith. Okay, go ahead, please. 14.1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Pi Hahira, between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. Okay, so here we are. This is, this is as they're in this big open wilderness here, and here's the Red Sea over here. And there's a place called Pihahibroth right here. And what that means in Hebrew, it, it could mean one of two things. Okay, if you use the Hebrew, if you use uh, the uh, Egyptian. The Hebrew says the mouth of the gorges, which would tell you that there is probably an inlet right here that the people were led into. Okay, and on both sides are giant mountains. Okay. In other words, there's this gorge, and here's the mouth of the gorge. And it would have to be a very large place because we have 603,550 men and women, and, or men, plus women, children, goats, carts, and all this other stuff. This would have to be a very large beachhead 
in other words. And they're in the mouth of the gorges, Pihahiroth. And then it says it's opposite Baal Zemphan. Well, there is really, and I don't know this for sure, but there have been people that have gone over there and they believe that they have found this particular location because it's a very large open space on the Red Sea that is surrounded by gorges on both sides. So here's what we have. We've got the Egyptian army. We already know from last week they're starting to chase after these people. God is specifically directing them and he said that I'm going to take them this way and the Egyptians will think that uh, we're confused and we're lost and then God says I'm going to gain victory over them. Okay, so the Egyptians are chasing them and God is specifically leading them into a no exit scenario so that he can gain glory for himself, all right? Pihira, mountains on this side, mountains on this side, the Egyptian army coming behind them, and an impassable body of water here. That is what's coming. Okay, go ahead. Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. And this is the Lord directing this. Remember, he's saying they are going to feel that they are uh, uh, lost. The Egyptians are going to say they're lost. They're just, and we're going to be able to go and get these guys and get them back into the land. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. Okay, now this is, you have to kind of think this one through from after the occurrence. Okay, right now we're looking at this forward, not knowing what's coming. But we know that and most everybody in here should know what the result of the Egyptian army going after them is. Anybody remember what, what, what's going to happen to the Egyptian army? Okay. And you're going to see the same terminology in Ezekiel. These things will happen, and it always means death. These armies are going to be destroyed, and then they will know that I am the Lord. In other words, some people, it takes dying to face a holy God and understanding I was wrong. And so you have to look at this kind of from back, then they will know that I am the Lord. Well, they're all dead. Yes, now they know that he is the Lord. You see? Anyway, but you don't know that at this point. You don't know what's coming. So you don't understand the full uh, brunt of what God is saying. But when you look back and say, oh, then they will know that I am the Lord, and they're all dead. They're all standing facing their, their uh, accuser. Okay, go ahead. And they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? <laughs> so he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Okay, now, if you think of that in a modern context, it sounds so incredibly stupid because why have we done this, right? Why have we done this? allowing them to leave. When it, it, he even said, what is it? Uh, why have we done this that we have let Israel go from serving us? They have just gone through the 10 most devastating plagues imaginable. And they absolutely proved that God did it because he said, you pick the time when this plague will end. You pick the time when this plague will begin, etc. All right. It, it, there was no doubt about what had happened. Even if it was naturalistically explained, and as I said, a couple of them cannot be, but some of them can be, the, the fact that they happened exactly when Pharaoh said, I want this to end, and it did, or when this is to begin, and it did, shows that God is in control of these plagues. And then the firstborn is killed. The people are all in mourning. And think of it from our own context, though. You say, what a bunch of idiots, right? I mean, that's what you think. But don't we do the same thing here? I mean, literally, how quickly after 9-11 did we start saying, well, we need to not make the Muslims angry? They've already destroyed half of, you know, half of our economy in two buildings. They've tried to destroy the White House. They've also attacked the Pentagon, right? And within six months, nobody would, don't say anything bad about the Muslims. They're our friends. And so you look at this and you say, what a bunch of idiots. But when you look at us in our own history, the Japanese. Now, admittedly, after the war, we went in, we occupied Japan, and eventually they became our allies. But it, people tend to forget within no time at all how quickly or how, how y you know what I'm trying to say. People forget the devastation very quickly, and they just turn away from it. And that's just, that's the nature of man. Yes? And on the other side, I think that same thing about 
the Middle East that surrounds Israel, time and time again they've attacked and been annihilated. Why Perfect they example. Be able to do that? Perfect example. And yet they do not get it through their thick heads. Maybe God. Maybe God. Yeah, you know, some of you weren't in here when I brought this up before, but when Israel was established as a nation on 14 May of 1948. They turned on the radio and uh, Ben Gurion said the nation of Israel is reestablished. Okay, whatever. And uh, so here they are, they're reestablished as a nation immediately. That day, every Muslim nation on earth declared war on them. All of them. And they were outnumbered like, you know, hundreds to one. Hundreds to one. And there were no weapons available because the weapons were under the British mandate. They controlled the land at the time. Okay, They were attacked and the, the few weapons that the Jewish people had, they, uh, you know, it, they'd gotten some, but I mean there wasn't an infrastructure of weapons. There was one operating factory at the time in Israel. Do you remember what it was? There was one operating factory that they, they it was a lipstick factory. Remember this? I brought this up. Maybe it was in the other class. Lipstick factory. And guess what size the lipstick cases were? They fit the rifles that the, the, all, the, all the bullets. In other words, they just happened to have something that could be modified to make bullets for the guns. Yeah, yeah you know. Anyway, so that's one of the, the, the coincidences. And there are these other things that just happened during the reestablishment of Israel. These nations attacked, and it was absolutely, without a doubt, impossible that Israel could have survived that month. And yet they did. And then what happens less than 20 years later, they're attacked again. Actually, they're not attacked. I, I, I don't want to mislead you on this. The Six-Day War, Israel preemptively struck because they knew they were going to be attacked. The evidence was there. They had all of the intelligence. They had everything lined up against the Israel. And they said, we have no choice. We have to go out and we have to do this. So they did a strike on Egypt from the north and from the side with their airplanes. And within, what was it, two minutes or something? They had destroyed the Egyptians' ability to wage war. All over the desert. All over. It was just, you know, it, it, once again, an impossible scenario was delivered. And then on Yom Kippur in 1973, they are attacked from the north through, from Syria through the Golan Heights, from Egypt through the, the uh, Sinai Peninsula. There's no possibility that Israel can survive this attack, and they survived. In one of these three wars, I don't remember which one, they were so limited in the armament they had, I think it was 1948 war, what they did is they took drums and they put rocks in them and they rolled them to make it sound like tanks, and people would go in the opposite direction when they'd hear these things. I mean, these Jewish people are not dummies. And I have stood right there at the north of Israel, right there, where a line of tanks was coming down uh, from, uh, they were French-made tanks, and they're really small by today's standards, but there was a line of French tanks was coming down from the north, and the Jewish people won against the tanks with nothing. All they had was Molotov cocktails. They, they didn't have any war capability in this particular area, and they stopped an entire line of tanks with their bare hands and with Molotov cocktails. And one of those tanks, the first one in the column, is sitting there to this day, I've got a picture of me with it, right there to show that they had actually defeated this tank just by digging some trenches, laying down, and at the right moment getting there. and do, eh, Unbelievable. Absolutely astonishing what God has done to protect his people against their enemies. And you're right. That's a perfect example. Here we think people are so stupid. And, and the reason why I'm bringing all of this up, and it's kind of fun talking anyway, but is that we look at him as an idiot. Why would he chase after the Israelites? Well, you know what? It's just the nature of man. We do it all the time. We have the evidence. People are denying the Holocaust right now. And why did Eisenhower go in into... Yes? The F word that you were referring to about forgetting. Oh, yeah. Why couldn't the F word be forgiven? That's true. You know, I mean, if people are willing, if they are willing to be forgiven. God leaves that up to everybody individually and collectively as nations. And I don't, I don't in any way dispute that. But, you know, as I said, here God has given us his word here. He said, this is, this is what I am proclaiming to be my word. 
and then somebody else writes a book, whether it's Satan or whether it's a human being. He says, no, this is my word, and this is my word. And that's why it is very important never to argue from the Bible about the Bible. 